Okay, now we're gonna turn our focus to Snapdragon Sight. So I'd like to introduce Judd Heap, VP of Product Management. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, isn't this venue cool? I mean, it's beautiful, right? And welcome back to Maui. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the, the keynote was a little tedious for me. You know, it's scripted, um, it's nerve wracking, it's live streamed. This is the fun part. Yeah. This, this is gonna be great. Um, in this tech talk, I've got lots of slides to show you. I've got, I think, 11 videos, four demos, and one um, uh, walk on appearance for you guys. So, this is gonna be great. Settle in, I hope you're comfortable. <laughs> okay, well, let's get right to it. So as we've said, Snapdragon is the new professional quality camera. And I wanted to show some of, the, some of the shots we showed today in the keynote. You know, from a picture of your pet, to really interesting pictures with the moon, to really gorgeous, beautiful landscapes in the fall. You know, excellent, just rich colors. Even some really nice 3D shots. And cityscapes and really great nature shots. Very, very beautiful stuff. And of course, you know, vivid colors, like these lamps in a, in a restaurant. These are just awesome photos that, you know, maybe some of you took, you know, because I think some of these were submitted from our Snapdragon Insiders team. So these are awesome. Thousands of photos, millions of views. It's just incredible what the Snapdragon community has captured with Snapdragon Sight camera. So in the, in the, uh, in the keynote, we talked about uh, the new ISP, but I want to give a little bit of history before we jump right into Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. Let's talk a little bit about where we've come from, particularly last year on Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. So last year we talked about that the Spectra ISP was the first 18-bit triple ISP capturing a billion shades of color from three cameras simultaneously. And again, um, this, this was what we introduced last year, moving from 14-bit to 18-bit. And that's really quite unique because 18 bits is 4,000 times more image data than with 14-bit. It's, it's four bits more per color, which, which is 4,000 more values. Um, also, I mentioned in the keynote that we lead, Snapdragon Camera leads on every single uh, metric in the industry, and I want to point out that a lot of these features, the 10 here on this slide, were actually commercialized. We talked about them last year. They were commercialized on OEM handsets. And this includes AKHDR. This includes capture in hybrid log gamma, HDR10, 10, 10 plus, Dolby Vision, computational HDR video capture, 4K slow-mo, uh, staggered HDR and digital overlap HDR from Sony. One-inch image sensors were deployed on smartphones for the first time. 200 megapixel image sensors were deployed. 10-bit HEIF, uh, you know, for 10-bit high dynamic range snapshots, which are cross-compatible ac across platform, were all deployed. 16-bit RAW was actually introduced by one of our, one of our partners. And finally, multi-camera capture has been around for a while. So all of these features you know, weren't just things we talked about. They actually made it into real handsets. So let's, let's go through a few of these that were quite unique last year. So the first is breakthrough zoom. And by breakthrough, I mean that it's not just a tele camera with a fixed focal length. Um, this last year, Sony introduced the Xperia 1 Mark IV, which it, if you guys don't know, for the first time, this actually had a movable zoom lens inside the cavity of the phone. So it had actual moving optics. So this was a camera that actually can change in, in focal length from 3.5x to 5.2x with a movable lens. So it's, it's a lot like you know, what a traditional camera would, would operate like. Of course, Samsung leads the industry with, with full telephoto. They have a 10x zoom or a 10x telephoto camera, which gives them incredible amounts of zoom when you combine this with in-sensor zoom and digital zoom. So really, they lead this metric. Also in terms of sizes of image sensors, um, 
Our biggest competitor you know, is at one over 1.65 inches, a modest size image sensor. There are bigger image sensors, but of course, really nothing compares in the industry to a full one inch image sensor. And this is important because the bigger the image sensor, the more light you capture, the better you do at night, uh, the higher fidelity your photos, the better signal to noise, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important to be able to support really, really large image sensors in, in smartphones. That's what I feel is probably the way of the future. Um, and so four OEMs last year released cameras on, on their smartphones with one inch image sensors from Xiaomi, Sony, Sharp, and, and the Lights phone all had one inch image sensors, which is you know, just a, a breakthrough in the industry. You see how huge these lenses are on these handsets. But it's not just about the size of the image sensor, it's also about how many pixels you have, of course. Um, so I mentioned we lead the metric. No other platform in the industry for smartphones has gone this high in resolution. 108 megapixels, we've had it for a few years. It was on the, the, uh, the Galaxy device last year. But 200 megapixels, we finally hit that, that or broke that barrier. Uh, the Motorola Edge 30 Ultra boasted a 200 megapixel image sensor, which is just incredible. I, I showed an image in the, uh, in the keynote today and how much detail that actually gets. And it, it really does give you you know, unique control when you zoom and zoom and zoom and go into your image, there's a tremendous amount of detail there. Capturing in billions of shades of color. Um, you know, we talked about 8K HDR video capture. Last year we talked about this, that we, uh, we released 8K30 on Snapdragon 865 for, for video capture, but we upped that game on that last year to include 10-bit HDR. And finally, I mentioned this before, 10-bit HEIF, not just video, but also snapshots can be captured in true 10-bit HDR format, exchanged with your devices, and it's, it's fully supported in that container on Snapdragon. And then, of course, we have computational photography. Um, back on Snapdragon 855, we talked about the fact that we had a CV, a computer vision ISP. That is really enabled by a block inside Snapdragon called the Engine for Visual Analytics, or EVA. It's kind of a mouthful, but it really does usher in a lot of these features because this particular block is a hardware, a hardware accelerated block that does motion. Uh, it, it, it calculates um, depth from stereo for depth. Uh, it, it identifies objects, many, many things that, that help the camera and help the video experience. So I won't list these off, you have the slide here, but um, you know, if we were to talk about all these, it would take much longer than I'm gonna take anyway. So now let's turn our focus to Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. But wait, I also wanna give you a history lesson as well. I wasn't a great history student, but I wanna, I wanna show you a few things about where we've come from so everyone can appreciate the innovation that Qualcomm is doing on camera. It's just, it's extreme. So before Snapdragon 845, um, this was a while back, the ISP was simple. It was one image sensor and it captured one frame of, of data for photo or video, very simple. Uh, then on Snapdragon 845, we switched to the Spectra ISP. And Spectra was born a dual ISP, which meant it could handle two cameras at once. So two cameras were operational but also six frames. So in the, in the temporal domain, we captured more frames than just one. And that ushered in the first dawn of multi-frame processing. So for snapshots, this enabled multi-frame noise reduction. We could capture multiple frames, average over them to, to get rid of noise. And in video, this enabled motion compensated temporal filtering, where you average lots of frames together in video to get rid of noise, and it runs recursively, and, and it, it works great. This was done you know, many years ago on, on 845. Then on Snapdragon 855, as I mentioned before, we went to the computer vision ISP. This is where this EVA engine I talked about a second ago was ushered in. And one of the things this was able to do was bring in depth processing actually into the ISP. So the camera knows you know, not just about flat images, it knows how far away images are because it can, like your eyes, you know, use two cameras and, and compute depth from the disparity. Then on Snapdragon 865, um, we kind of upped the game by going to four pixels per clock. You may remember I mentioned that here in Maui, gosh, what, four years ago. Um, it, was, it still handled two cameras, and we did six frames of capture, all at 14-bit, 
But this ushered in the ability not just to do HDR, but also to do 8K30 video capture, which you know, was a, a really breakthrough in the industry. There was no other smartphone anywhere that could do anything above 4K video. Then, last year, or sorry, two years ago on Snapdragon 888, we tripled it, we went to three cameras, and this ushered in a lot of really cool features um, like director's mode, for example, where you could run two of the back cameras, one of the front, front cameras simultaneously. Uh, this was great for video bloggers. They could shoot something and you could comment on it at the same time. It, it was a really cool feature. Each one of these ISPs was also six frames, also 14 bits each. So you can see how the ISP is you know, getting more, more growth, more, more capability. And then last year, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, we, we, we took the temporal domain and stretched it like crazy. We went from six frames captured temporally to 30. So five times more image data was captured uh, with this ISP, and that really gave us the ability to get rid of much more noise, improve the signal to noise ratio, just give you great looking videos and, and photos at nighttime. And you know, we did something else, we went to 18 bits. The, the 4,096 times more data I talked about, we went to 18 bits, which, which really just you know, raised the bar again on the ability to do high dynamic range, m merging multiple exposures together. We needed that, that many bits to do that properly. And so now, finally, Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. This slide is pretty advanced. There, it takes a second to load. Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, we're doing something really different. I mentioned this in the, uh, in the keynote. Chris mentioned it as well. We've taken the ISP and we, you know, we had a number of cameras, we had temporal domain, we had, we had all this great stuff, but now we've pulled this into another dimension, layers. So how many of you in here have used Adobe Photoshop? Some of you? Yeah, okay, good, good. You know what layer processing is, right? Where you can, you can basically take different parts of your scene and process them on different layers individually. So that, for example, if you have uh, a segment of the scene in a layer that is skin, you can make skin look smoother. Um, if you have hair, you could up the contrast or the, the sharpness of the hair to make it look a little bit more texture filled or, or same thing with clothing. You could make sky bluer, that sort of thing. This is what we've done on Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 in the ISP. This is done in hardware, so the ISP is processing not just one layer of video, it's processing up to eight. And those layers can be defined. You know, like I said, it can be skin, sky, grass, you know, fabric, et cetera. But that's programmable. So the important thing is that for every pixel in the frame, the ISP knows what layer that's in and can basically apply different tuning parameters in terms of color, sharpness, noise reduction, tone to each one of those layers. So again, this is happening in hardware, in real time, it works in the viewfinder, it works for video, it works for snapshot. It's just an incredible amount of processing. So this is the really big update on Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. And the way this is enabled is that it's, it's a, done in concert between the, uh, the hexagon or the, the AI engine and the ISP. So we're calling this the world's first cognitive ISP. So on this figure, you see the hexagon processor. This is where the segmentation network is actually running. So the network that's, that's determining in the scene you know, where, where the faces are, where the sky is, where the grass is, that's running programmable. And so Qualcomm, we provide a segmentation network that identifies you know, people and sky and, and fabric and that sort of thing, but also our partners like ArcSoft, you know, they can run a segmentation network that identifies other things, different objects, and that can run programmably in, in the AI engine. And the reason why that you know, it can be us or it can be a partner is because the interface between the AI engine and the ISP is standardized. So anybody, including our OEMs, can put whatever they want in the AI engine to identify what are the, whatever objects they want, and then those can be processed as layers in the ISP separately. So it's, it's quite, quite unique, it's quite programmable and quite flexible. So we're calling this the cognitive ISP once again. So it does the real-time segmentation filter in the AI engine. That's fed through the hexagon direct link. That's these three links here, directly from the AI engine to the ISP for every pixel, every frame at 60 frames per second. So this happens in real time. We can do up to eight layers, meaning, you know, like I said, sky, fabric, you know, skin, hair, et cetera. And 
we can apply a custom tre treatment to each layer in the ISP. Like I said, different tuning, uh, smoothness, uh, noise reduction, color, uh, sharpness, contrast, et cetera. And like I said before, this works in not just photo capture, which in the olden days, we even talked about this on 865, you could do segmentation, but it had to be done after the fact, it can only be done for a photo. This, because this is in hardware and it's hardened, it can do photo, video, or viewfinder all at the same time. So it's, it's quite, quite unique. So let's show an example of this. So ArcSoft, our partner, like I said, they have come up with a segmentation network. This is showing some of the things they can do in the network and identify you know, body, people, et cetera. And then they can apply this to video. So after the segmentation network has been run, it's forwarded to the ISP, and then the ISP can make these types of changes. So we showed this in the, in the keynote. You know, you can actually remove glare from, some, from glasses, for example. Or if you segment, for example, an error in depth, you can actually correct the bouquet through someone's lenses and their glasses. This is pretty interesting as well. Really interesting use case. Or for, for better skin tone, we can segment each face, and each one of those faces can either be smoothed or, or the tone can be adjusted to be a little bit more uh, visible, for example. And this can be done differently for each face in the frame if they're on separate layers. So a lot of power here, a lot of capability. And then ArcSoft goes on to show a few more examples of segmenting someone's face, this shows smoothing, and it shows colorizing the lips a little bit more for a little bit more vibrancy, a little bit more detail in the hair as well. And again, these are static images, but of course this works with video as well. And then this is quite unique as well. You know, sometimes our clothing can get a little flattened in the camera, but if you segment the clothing, you can actually increase the sharpness a little bit and pull out more texture in fabric. Finally, objects, you know, everyone loves their pets. Uh, maybe you take a picture and it's a little bit soft. What you can do is have the segmentation engine with the cognitive ISP actually make the hair a little bit more defined. Another interesting use case is segmenting text, like in a book, and you could increase the legibility or the readability based upon the segmentation. This one's really cool. You can actually take depth information and fuse it with the segmenting engine and correct bouquet errors like around the straw. And then finally, there's a couple examples here of food, segmenting food to make it look a little bit more yummy. Another example, flowers, making flowers a little bit more vibrant. And then there's a couple of landscape examples here as well. I mentioned grass before. So grass and sky, you can take the sky and bump up the saturation a little bit, make the sky a little bit more bluer, maybe a little bit more like how you might remember it on a great day. And then also the grass, you know, like I said, one of the things you can do in the ISP is increase the sharpness so that we can make blades of grass a little bit more visible. And then finally, you can make water a little bit more vibrant as well, make it look a little bit more turquoise. So that's, that's what Arcsoft has been able to do with us, uh, running their AI algorithm in the AI engine for segmentation and then fusing it with the ISP. I think this is pretty cool. What do you guys think? Excellent. And then we've done the same thing. You know, we have a, a, a segmentation filter that we've done. Again, it's very similar. We can uh, increase the detail in hair, smooth skin, and also take the video, or take the, uh, the fabric and make it a little bit more sharp. Like I said here, it works with video as well, not just in photograph mode, it works in video. You might notice Jeff is in this video. <laughs> so again, Qualcomm offers the segmentation network. Our partners offer it. Works with photos, works with, works with videos smooth skin, increase uh, detail in hair, detail in fabric, et cetera. And so now we have a demo. Uh, we're gonna do this demo live with PJ right here. Please take a look at the screens. And what you'll see here is on the left is an unchanged image. On the right is the image that's been processed, and there's actually two faces behind you, PJ, because it's seeing you behind there. But the image that's been processed with the segmentation network and the cognitive ISP. PJ, you rock, man. So you can see here, okay, wait, before we get there, you, you, can see, you can see PJ's face is much smoother on the one on the right. We have bumped up this processing so it's really easy to see here. You can see the saturation on his shirt's a little bit higher. 
Uh, you might see a little bit more detail in his hair. Uh, now, PJ, if you slide the slider up, this is not what you would normally do. I don't want to turn PJ into the Hulk. But um, what we're showing here is that the, the, the <laughs> you're distracting me, man. The, the AI engine understands what it's seeing. So we colorize skin separately so that we show, hey, this is one of the segments which ends up as one of the layers that's processed in the ISP. So this is just on the left, it's just to show that you know, the, the engine understands the difference between skin and his lips and his teeth, et cetera. So, and his hair. All right, thank you for the demo, PJ, appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so switching gears a little bit to our partners. Um, we were really, really fortunate last year to announce a partnership with Sony in which we developed a joint lab together in San Diego to really talk about and uh, work on the next generation of image sensors. Um, and so this lab has been in place for one year now. I mentioned in the, uh, in the, in the uh, 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 keynote that um, you know, we've done this for one year and we wanted to show you guys the fruits of our labor, you know, not just announce that we've you know, done a joint lab, what have, what's really come of it? And so what's come of it is quad exposure. And so you guys may be aware of the term staggered HDR in image sensors or digital overlap HDR. Typically, you know, when you bracket exposure in the image sensor and you output these exposures, it's one, two, or it's two or three exposures. Sony has broken that barrier and gone to four exposures. And so, like I said in the keynote, we've got not one but two image sensors. The Sony IMX800, which is a QDOL4, the quad exposure image sensor. It's a one over 1.5 inch image sensor. And then also the Sony IMX989, which is a, a one inch version of the same image sensor. So both of these do the quad exposure and both have been really fine tuned for Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. Now, um, I would like to introduce Sony themselves. Uh, Mikaria san is here and he's gonna tell you so much more about the partnership and the things we've accomplished over the last year. So I'd like to welcome, it's my honor to welcome Mikaria san to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Um, my name is Michiki Mikuria uh, from Sony Semiconductor Solutions Corporation. Uh, by the way, I hope my video will be recorded with a semantic segmentation with a beautification of my face <laughs> by Snapdragon Technology. Okay. I'm really honored to be here to present our joint effort with Qualcomm. And let me start from uh, uh, Sony Semiconductor Solutions strategy. Most people agree that still picture quality uh, taken by uh, recent smartphones are quite a bit closer to DSLR. Uh, that is driven by uh, current um, advanced technologies such as uh, large image sensor utilization or high dynamic range or AI processing. Moving towards 2030, Sony Semiconductor Solutions' intent is to continue to enhance and evolve photography experiences in still images and videos and in uh, picture production. In order to realize those goals, we believe that um, system collaboration between the image sensor and the application processor is very, very important in Android smartphones. Qualcomm and Sony lead worldwide cutting-edge mobile imaging technologies. Sony's image sensors has been adopted for use in many, many flagship smartphones, as has the Snapdragon chipset. So both companies contributed to increasing our customer values. Qualcomm introduced uh, the establishment of joint lab with Sony at last year's Snapdragon Summit. The purpose of Joint Lab is to optimize mobile imaging technology at the system level and to provide the best experience and the earliest product availability to the consumers. We are working together on the Joint Lab at Qualcomm's campus. The members have lively discussions and uh, a lot of development over a range of things. 
At first, high image quality is one of the most important proportion in mobile imaging, especially developing excellent HDR as close as human eye is most important activities. In conventional HDR, our image sensor will be taking two shutters with different exposures, then application processor synthesizes. Now, Sony has been developing new image sensors that output two HDR images from four different exposures. Then the application processor synthesizes those two images. We call this new HDR as a quad digital overlap HDR. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, most interesting part. Uh, you see the conventional HDR and the new HDR comparison. As you can see, new HDR has improved the noise level at the dark area. Sony is first to develop this um, new quad digital overlap HDR technology, and which is fine-tuned for Snapdragon. Now let me move on to next topic, which is a Marish camera system. In order to have a best experience from a Marish camera system, it is important that each camera coordinates seamlessly when in zoom. However, the power consumption becomes a major issue when all cameras are fully operating. So Sony is developing a brand new optimal marriage camera system with low power consumption. In our new optimal marriage camera system, when the main capturing camera is working, the other cameras work at the very low power consumption with three operations. By doing so, the, all the cameras are well synchronized but our power consumption is well controlled. This is an image movie of the system we are developing. The camera is running in the background, is operating, but at very low power consumption. That enables a smooth transition between the cameras. And you will notice that Exposure, white balance, and focus is stable, even when the camera switches. Sony image sensors deliver high image quality advanced technology to enable high quality photography and videography in many smartphones. Now let me introduce to you our recently announced new mobile image sensor product brand that aims to deliver a creative experience beyond the imagination, Lightyear. <laughs> Sony Semiconductor Solution will continue to provide uh, customers with our value-added mobile imaging experiences through collaboration between Snapdragon and Lightyear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Let's continue. Thank you, Mikuria-san, very much for that great presentation. I think the, uh, the QDU L4 technology speaks for itself. You know, many people think that high dynamic range is really about you know, getting more detail. It's really about reducing noise. And so this, this fourth exposure to really have a long exposure time to get rid of the noise in the darkest part of the scene is, is super, super important. So we're really happy to partner with Sony on that. It's great. I'd also like to announce, which I did in uh, the uh, um, keynote as well, that we are also working
for the first time with Samsung on image sensor technology as well. And we have recently just worked with them on a new image sensor called the ISOCELL HP3 200 megapixel image sensor. And this image sensor is, is really uh, quite unique. It's the one that I spoke about. It, it's actually its predecessor is the one I spoke about before uh, in the Motorola handset. Uh, this image sensor, 200 megapixels, uh, does 8K video capture. Uh, it also has HDR capability, uh, and it, it works in various modes like 200 megapixel, 50 megapixel, and 12.5 megapixel. But let me just show you Samsung a video about and this. Have been working closely together to create a professional quality camera and to develop next-gen camera technologies. To innovate on camera technologies faster than ever. We are working together in the earlier stages of image sensor and ISP development. For our first project together, we've made optimizations on the Samsung ISOCELL HP3, the new 200 megapixel image sensor, enabling ultra high resolution photo capture with AI software and real time hardware remosaic running on the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 mobile platform. This will allow smartphones to capture full 200 megapixel photos at extremely high speeds and capture with HDR color, as well as deliver advanced computational photography features and AI experiences. Furthermore, Snapdragon will be able to operate the ISOCELL HP3 in all capture modes, including 200 megapixel, 50 megapixel, or 12.5 megapixel bend resolution for extreme low light. Staggered HDR mode that delivers video with extreme dynamic range and 8K video recording for crystal clear video with sharp details. The Samsung ISOCELL HP3 optimized for Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 will deliver professional quality photos and videos. Expect these professional quality cameras and smartphones in 2023. All right. So yeah, expect this sensor out in 2023. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, let's talk about even another image sensor technology, um, Prophecy. Is, is a company that has developed a really unique image sensor called an event-based vision sensor. Um, and it's really unique because our world does not actually operate in 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second with a, a scanning raster. It, it doesn't do that. Um, our eyes, our visual system perceives things much more uh, detailed with a lot better temporal resolution. And so, these image sensors are quite unique in that they don't, they're not fixed to a certain um, frame rate, for example. So, and there's some benefits to that. So the Prophecy image sensor has a lot of really unique characteristics. The first is that it can run at an equivalency of 10,000 frames per second. Because this image sensor, like I said, is not locked to like 30 or 60 frames. It outputs data only when there's an event or a change in the scene. So the essence of the scene is captured. Only the changes are captured. This can lead to much less bandwidth coming out of the sensor. Because if you have the camera pointed at a static scene, why output any data? You know, why, why, why waste battery life doing that if the scene hasn't changed? So this sensor actually does that. Um, it also can work in extreme lighting conditions. This sensor can be programmed to work at you know, 120 dB of dynamic range. A huge amount of HDR dynamic range. And finally, it works at really, really low power. So it's a quite unique technology. We're working with Prophecy to bring this technology to smartphones. And so I'd like to play a video for you from Luca, who is their CEO. Uh, the video is in French, but it has subtitles, so please take a look. L'œil sert pour comprendre l'environnement et pour réagir, prendre des décisions en fonction des changements qu'il y a dans cet environnement. Parce que cela permet à, à l'homme ou aux organismes biologiques de réagir euh, vite par rapport à ces changements et se protéger éventuellement à des risques. L'acquisition se fait à travers hein, la lumière. Donc la lumière, c'est des photons qui réfléchissent sur des objets et les photons sont capturés par hein, la rétine. Dans la rétine, en fait, il y a des systèmes de photorécepteurs, bâtonnets et des cônes qui vont absorber les photons de la lumière et ils vont accueillir cette information de manière asynchrone, c'est-à-dire au fur et à mesure que le, la lumière arrive sur la rétine, les photons sont ensuite transformés en signaux 
électrochimique est transmis par les nerfs optiques au cortex, qui est une partie du cerveau qui traite ces signaux électriques. Une technologie de vision classique, comme celle qui est en train de nous filmer, génère une vidéo par séquence d'images à des points fixes. La technologie prophétie, inspirée du fonctionnement de la rétine biologique, euh, n'a plus cette euh, notion d'acquisition image par image. Nous avons en fait des pixels qui fonctionnent comme les photorécepteurs de la rétine, donc qui sont indépendants et asynchrones. Et donc on a des pixels qui vont réagir en ce moment s'il y a des changements dans la scène. Donc ce que l'on est en train d'observer dans l'écran, euh, c'est des petits points qui correspondent aux événements, donc aux variations de contraste, qui correspondent typiquement à un changement, à une dynamique, donc mémant, euh, les mouvements de ma tête, mes lèvres, mes bras, etc., qui sont récupérés. Toute la partie statique, donc le plafond et les sols, par exemple, ne sont pas à chaque fois récupérés. Donc quand je ne bouge plus, il n'y a plus d'informations, donc euh, il n'y a plus de données. Really interesting and unique technology. Um, and it works a lot like the human eye, which I think uh, Luca mentioned here. But you might ask yourself, why? What's, what's the purpose of this? Why would this be important for a mobile application? So let me show you. You see here that we're using an RGB camera, a standard camera on the left, to capture someone playing tennis. And on the right, is the image that comes out of the prophecy event-based vision sensor. And so, like I said, the one on the left, the RGB camera, operates at a fixed frame rate, 30 or 60 frames per second. The prophecy image sensor operates 10, 100 times faster than that. So the prophecy image sensor can actually output only pixels that change, and they can output them really, really quickly. So as far as when the person swings the racket, it's sampling 10,000 times more data than the RGB sensor is. So the, the movement, the, fine, the, the, the really tiny movements are, are captured so much better. And again, why is this important for smartphones? The reason why this is important is because if you take an action sports shot and you use a standard image sensor that's locked to a certain frame rate, you get an image like that, where the, uh, the actual uh, static image has motion blur. So the one on the left, where the racket is in motion, it's completely blurred. And there's no easy way to get around that unless you up the frame rate. But then that lowers your light, and it's, you know becomes a real problem. But if you can intelligently combine the data from the RGB sensor with the event-based sensor from Prophecy, fuse those together, what we can do is we can apply that, that tons of motion data from the Prophecy sensor to the RGB side and then get rid of the motion. So this will get rid of all of the motion blur in, in your shots. And so the good news is that we're working really closely with Prophecy to bring this motion reduction technology for static images into smartphones. So you'll see this really soon. Really cool technology. So let me shift gears a bit and talk about bouquet, portrait video and portrait photography. Last year on 8 Gen 1, we talked about how we have a, a hardware-based bouquet engine. And that engine uh, was capable of, of creating these blur shapes uh, completely in hardware at low power, and it worked for video. Now, on Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, we've taken this engine and we've taken it a step further. So we said to ourselves, why not modify the bouquet engine so that it could simulate different F numbers of lenses. So something from F14 all the way down to F1.4. And when you do that, when you, when you simulate a larger aperture, what you end up with is bouquet shapes that are a lot bigger, a lot more intense. So that's one of the cool things we can do live with this technology that's now in hardware in Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. And so we actually, oh, this is first a video here. The intensity of out of focus sources of light in the background or change the effect entirely with radical new bouquet shapes that are hardware accelerated to save power. Now, did you see that? Not only can we change the bouquet size based upon the F number, a simulated F number, we can change the shape. So this is really gonna be cool for people who wanna do fun you know, videos or selfie photography where they want to change the, the standard kind of blur circle into a diamond, into a heart, et cetera. So to show you that this is Real, I have my esteemed colleague Jeff here, and we're gonna show this actually live. So take a look at, at the screens here. 
so you see behind him, we have simulated Christmas lights behind him. And you can see here that he can change the shape of those blurred lights from circles to diamonds to hearts. Or he can change the intensity of the, of the bouquet. So back to the standard with no bouquet at all, he can sweep and go right back between, you know, kind of a, a very subtle effect to a very extreme effect with a really fast lens. And again, you see this in the viewfinder. This is happening in hardware, in real time, 60 frames per second, and can be shot with video or photo. So pretty cool stuff. And you can only do this in hardware. Thanks, Jeff. OK, let's also talk about ultra low light. Um, in the past, I've talked about our low light engine and how we've been able to really reduce noise efficiently to get really, really good performance in low light. Um, I want to show you a video about our next generation video low light solution. Um, you're not going to see you know, a huge like, burst of light, because that's really not what we're after here. You know, we're not trying to create light that isn't there. We still want the scene to look natural, to look nighttime. We don't want it to look you know, like it's daytime when it's really not. But pay attention in these video clips to the noise, the level of noise that you see. Uh, because a truly, really good low light engine, if it's gonna work properly, it's gonna get rid of noise. So check this out. So you see the video here, we start out. We're showing a couple of side-by-sides. Without's on the left, with our ultra low light engine is on the right. And as we zoom into detail, take a look at the scintillation noise on the left that isn't present on the right. So with our, with our really, really advanced uh, noise processing technology, we can get rid of this, li this is live video, we can get rid of this noise quite well uh, in, in almost any scene in low light. So there's three examples here. This next example is more interesting because that's not a trash can. Um, sailboat, we'll zoom into the sky. And check that out, huge difference. The image on the right, the video on the right is so much cleaner, the one on the left is quite noisy. So again, this is done in our hardware. Uh, this is a modification of our, our multi, um, our, our, sorry, our motion compensated temporal filtering, in, temporal filtering engine to really attack noise in low light situations. So this is available right out of the box on Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 and it will really improve everyone's nighttime videography. Okay, another video feature, cinematic video. Again, this is from our partner ArcSoft, which I've showed a couple of videos before. Cinematic video, as you guys may know, is the ability for the uh, camera to refocus based upon what's happening in the scene. So for example, if, if I am holding an object in my hand and I look up at the camera, you should focus on my face and not the object. Or if I'm looking at the camera and I turn to someone because we're having a conversation, it should refocus on that person behind me. So that's exactly what ArcSoft has done here, and this is a feature that's available right now. So let me play this video for you. There we go. So I'll narrate this a little bit, but it kind of speaks for itself. So as you can see here, we have some nice portrait video. You see here that it's focused on the girl in the front. When she turns and looks at the one in the back, it switches to the person in the back. We're looking at objects here. And then as these two subjects are speaking to each other or going through these objects, you see the focus is changing from the object to their faces all automatically. Again, going from objects like the background to the hand. It also works in challenging situations like through a mirror, which is pretty interesting. And here you can see that it, it's natural. The change in focus is quite smooth, quite natural. It works even you know, if the subject goes behind a pane of glass, for example. Um, it works in, in really nice portrait mode. It works in low light. And this actual demo was done using a, uh, a DTOF, a, digital, or a, a direct time of flight image sensor. And so ArcSoft was able to do this on the Qualcomm QRD with this image sensor to get depth information so that they could do this rack focus type of approach. So it, really, really cool. And I think uh, a lot of our OEMs will like seeing this on Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 from ArcSoft. Okay, another feature, ProSight Video Capture. This is a new video capture mode that we have come up with at Qualcomm 
to improve video quality beyond what you can get in standard H.264 HEVC. So we've taken the bit rate of the video and we've upped it five times. And we're only actually using real video frames here. We're not using interpolated video frames. So to improve the quality of video, we want to get more detail, we want to get less noise, we want to get less artifacts, and we want to be able to still use this video in post-edit software. So what we've done here is we've capitalized on the existing format. We've not, we've not created a new codec here. This is still legal H.265 HEVC video, but we have changed it so that it's in pro mode. So ProSite video is available right out of the box on 8 Gen 2. Our video codec supports this. And it is, it is unique because not only is it high quality, but it also is, is able to be edited after the fact than something like Adobe Premiere. So let me play a video on this so you can see more about it. Site video mode captures much more image data than standard video capture, thanks to popular standard codec and high bitrate support from Adreno in Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, enabling a massive increase in sharpness, color, and high dynamic range that delivers professional video quality to consumers. The footage from ProSite video mode is perfect for professional video editors. ProSight video files are packed with data in every single frame, so editors can make dramatic enhancements to detail for any scene and any moment. Pretty cool. So like I said, everyone can capture better video right out of the box with Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. It's available now. OK, I've spoken a lot here. I've talked about you know, video features, low light features, et cetera. I didn't want to leave the room without giving you kind of a, a, a summary slide of all the other things we did in the ISP in 8 Gen 2 to improve the experience. So a few of these. We've improved accuracy of auto exposure. We've improved accuracy of focus. Uh, we have sped up the ability from shot to gallery and shot to shot in 8 Gen 2. So the, the ISP is actually much faster. Um, but one of the other interesting things we added in hardware in 8 Gen 2 is the ability to process any kind of color filter array. So you saw the video from Samsung about the uh, Isocell HP3, where it can work in 200 megapixel mode, 50 megapixel mode, 12.5 megapixel mode. These are binning modes where it's not standard bare data coming out of the sensor, it's like 2x or 4x the size. This is supported in our hardware, so that we can support all of these interesting new pixel formats, no matter what they are, standard bare or 2x or 4x standard bare, in the hardware and work with them directly. And we can support other oddball formats like RGBW, RGB white image sensors. This is supported in the hardware right out of the box in the ISP. So we've done a lot of work, not only you know, on, on all the other features I've mentioned, but really upgrading the hardware architecture of the ISP to support all of these new functions. But none of this would really be helpful to anybody if it were captive to the native camera app. So um, the shame in a lot, of, a lot of these features is that it, you know, it, it works with the native camera app, say from Samsung or Xiaomi, but as soon as you switch to a third party application like TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, some of these features, some of these great things we've done with our OEMs goes away. And that's because we lacked the, the ability to support these really new interesting hardware based features in the camera in Android. So we've worked really closely. My team has worked super close with Google in the past year. And so as our first kind of output in Android 13, we're announcing that we have native APIs in Android as well as uh, library extensions in Android, Google supported libraries, which can add a bunch of extra features that third party applications can get to. So a few examples of these. So third-party apps, like I said, TikTok, can now get to 10-bit HDR video capture, which they weren't able to do before. The apps, the third-party applications can use our bouquet engine for selfie capture. They can also use um, image stabilization on the selfie camera. Again, these APIs are supported right out of Android. And last but not least, third-party applications can shoot HDR video in Dolby Vision. It's not just you know, the, the native camera app anymore, but not just shoot, but also uh, playback and edit. This is all supported now in APIs, in native APIs in Android. And then finally, also, right out of the box with Android 13, 
200 megapixel uh, photo capture for these brand new image sensors that support this huge uh, resolution. So again, you know, third party apps, we wanna bring them into the fold. We wanna make sure that the best photography can happen anywhere. It doesn't matter if you're using the app that's provided by the OEM. It should, all these great things should also work with the third party apps you know, that everyone else develops in the industry. So we want the, the, the Android ecosystem for camera to really be universal. Okay, so the next thing is always sensing camera. Um, we talked about this last year, we called it always on camera, and there were some interesting articles written about always on camera. Um, but I wanna point out that, again, that this is a real revolution in smartphone security. You know, there, there's a lot of really great things that we can do with this camera. We changed the name to always sensing camera because it, it really reflects better what the camera is doing. This camera, which is embedded, it's a fourth ISP in the sensing hub, does not capture images. It does not output images. It's not a video camera. It's not recording. What this camera does, it outputs a one or a zero. It's a binary output. And this output says, did I detect a face, yes or no? Did I detect an object, yes or no? That's all this camera can do. Chris mentioned in the keynote that this data does not come, off the, not come out of the sensing hub. So this year, the unique change is that in the sensing hub, Chris mentioned that we have support for neural networks now. So the always sensing camera now can work with the AI engine embedded in the sensing hub and do this while the rest of the chip is completely turned off. So it's extremely low power. What that means is that it's not just about faces. You don't have to just detect faces. You can detect other objects while the phone is asleep. So one such use case of this, and I think it's a pretty cool use case, is the ability to scan a QR code for payment. So today, if you wanna you know, look up a menu or, or do a payment, you have to take your phone out of your pocket, you have to wake it up, you have to authenticate, you gotta find the camera app, you gotta start it, you gotta you know, point it at the QR code, then an image or a web page might come up or a payment app might come up, and then you know, if you're doing this with a bunch of people at a table around in a restaurant, it takes time, right? So wouldn't it be better if you could just take your phone while it's off and just hover it over the, HR, uh, the QR code? That's what we're able to do now with this new capability with always sensing camera and the AI engine built into the uh, sensing hub. So it's quite a unique use case and let me show you a video about this as well. Using an always sensing camera, you can scan QR codes without having to wake your device and increase privacy by auto-locking your screen when others can see over your shoulder. Or suppressing text messages while sharing the screen. Forget about locking orientation. The always sensing camera tracks your face to maintain the right screen orientation when lying down. Always sensing without compromising battery life. Okay, so this video showed other use cases. It showed the QR case, but also it showed a use case where uh, someone's looking over your shoulder and it, and it blacks out the screen for privacy. It showed a use case where two people are watching like a basketball game and maybe you want to suppress text messages from your girlfriend at the time. Or uh, it showed a use case where, which is kind of annoying if you have, if you ever tried to, you know, to use the uh, auto rotation feature and, you know, laying on your side, your face, if it's not perpendicular to gravity, it's always wrong. So in this case, the camera knows the orientation of your face and it always makes sure that the display is in line with your face no matter what direction gravity is coming from. So it's, it's a really nice use case. So we have a demo of this. I think that demo is gonna be running over here. Yes, Shivani, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna show a couple of use cases. I think we're gonna show the use case where uh, someone is peering over your shoulder first, right Shivani? Okay, so take a look at what happens here on the screen here. When someone goes over Shivani's shoulder, this is the beauty about live demos. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he doesn't like PJ's face. This really does work, I promise. 
It worked great in, in rehearsal. <laughs> Okay, what you should see here, when PJ puts his head in the, in the, in the same plane as Shivani, you should see it come up with a privacy alert or a notification that there are two people in the scene. We'll reboot and do a live okay, demo we'll reboot. for everybody. All right, I don't wanna, I wanna, keep, I don't wanna keep putting Shivani on the spot. Do you wanna do the, um, the, the other demo, the, the one for the, uh, the face orientation? Or should I skip it and come back? Okay. All right, so the second demo we're gonna show, which actually hopefully will work, is the one where uh, it doesn't matter what um, orientation your face is in versus gravity. But it will make sure that no matter what orientation you're in, that it always, this display always matches your face. And that's not working either, is it? Oh, okay, okay, good. <laughs> yes, so it's staying constant in portrait mode. Correct. Thanks, Giovanni. I'll, I'll, I'll let you off the hook. We'll, uh, we'll get this demo working and we'll, we'll come back to it. And again, the beauty of, of live, uh, live demos. Okay. So, since we had one successful demo, why don't we do another one? Um, okay, so the next demo is horizon leveling. And this is something that actually came organically out of our engineering team. Um, you know, we've had image stabilization for a long time on, on cameras, but one of the interesting things that we came up with is that we can actually use our really advanced um, uh, image stabilization engine and make sure that the horizon is always level no matter what. So how many of you, you know, get really annoyed when you see images posted on social media and the horizon is like tilted a little bit, right? It, you know, level isn't level. Um, that's really annoying to us, so we wanted to solve that problem. And so the demo we're gonna show here is two phones on the same, on the same jig. Uh, one phone is a uh, very well-known competitor and the one on the right is a Snapdragon QRD handset. And what will happen is Jeff will start to make you sick and, and rock, the, uh, rock the jig, and you'll see that the competitor's handset um, really doesn't do much for you, whereas the one on the right, the Qualcomm device, is rock solid. And so this horizon leveling, uh, again, will take away, and he's putting his hand in front of it to show that it's really live. Um, this will take away all of the guesswork out of capturing photos to make sure that you're always level, no matter what, if you're doing like a landscape scene, or even shooting video it'll be rock solid no matter what. You know, it doesn't matter if, if you know, you're, you're moving rapidly or your camera is a little bit tilted, it will be true and level. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I know I've kept you guys a long time. We're, we're in the home stretch here. So um, this has been an anticipated announcement, I think, by a lot of you for quite some time. So everyone knows about AV1, the new video codec. Uh, AV1 is now available on Snapdragon. So with 8 Gen 2, for the first time, we are supporting AV1 decode for playback, and this playback is supported at the same rate and resolution as all of our other codecs. So 8K at 60 frames per second, and even 8K HDR at 60 frames per second is supported, but we didn't drop anything else to support this codec. We still support the classic ones, VP9, H.264, H.265. We support all the HDR modes, HDR 10, 10 plus, Dolby Vision, hybrid log gamma, et cetera. So this is just an ad. So now AV1 is on Snapdragon. AV1 is real in mobile because it's supported by Qualcomm on Snapdragon. All right, and so for the last slide, everyone get your cameras out. Um, here's the summary. So again, you know, thank you guys for, for all you know, indulging me for probably what's been 45 minutes or so. The 11 videos, the four demos, three and a half demos. Um, everything we've shown here, I really am, am you know, happy to show you guys this in this kind of venue. This was fun. So again, ProSight Video Capture, our new video engine for, for uh, professional use. Um, the Prophecy Image Sensor, where we're, we're 
collaborating with them for event-based image sensor technology to get rid of motion blur in photographs, new Snapdragon-based APIs in Android 13 to unlock all these great camera features you know, for third-party applications, the cognitive ISP with the eight custom layers and the semantic segmentation filter, the new bouquet engine, which gives you the ability to change the intensity and the shape of the bouquet, support for AV1 decode, the new always sensing camera, which can detect more than just faces and do it in real time with, with very, very high security, so high even that the demo doesn't even work. And then also our work with Sony, with Mikuriya-san, thank you again, and Samsung on these image sensor collaborations. With, this has been a great year. We've done a huge amount of work on camera, and I want to thank all of you for, uh, for attending this and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Okay, thank you, Josh. Hey, Ellie, thank you. Um, since we are running a little bit over, okay. um, we're actually going to skip the Q&A portion. You're let me off the hook. I know, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, and obviously, we you know, feel terribly bad. So if you submitted a question for Judd, we will do our best to get it answered in another way. But we do want to give you time to yeah. see the demos and actually experience those um, before we leave for dinner, which is at 545. So. Sorry about that, Judd. Thank That's you right. so much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so everyone can uh, walk around the room and get hands-on with the demos. Thanks, everybody, again. Thank really appreciate coming. it.